Scion of a brave and prideful clan, which starting from the ragged and arid region of Jammu, gathered through its brawn and brain irrespective of the colour or religion. Along with the verdant valley of Kashmir, Ladakh and Gilgit in its fold, you really proved to be a pioneer so truly cast in your ancestral mould. An artist and a lover of arts who understands the condense of time, a man of many talents, many parts, a man for every season, every climb. Who changes with the times but retains the beauty of the past without chains. Politician, philosopher, orator and cultural ambassador. Dr. Karan Singh is the son of the late Maharaja Hari Singh, the last ruler of Jammu and Kashmir. He was the Prince Regent until 1952, former Union Cabinet Minister, Member of Parliament for over five decades, a scholar and an artist. A powerhouse of history, legacy, grace and cultural ethos. In the second edition of the Kuvar Vyogi Memorial Lecture Series, Dr. Karan Singh speaks on the role of Dogras in Indian history in his evocative and inspiring style. India is the most remarkable country. It has such a diversity of languages, of cultures. Despite an underlying unity, there are dozens of, of different ethnicities, shall we say. And these, all the way from Ladakh down to uh, Tamil Nadu, from Leh down to Kanyakumari, we have so many different uh, languages. Now, after the state's reorganization in 1956, there were the linguistic states. And the linguistic states meant that more or less each ethnic uh, entity had its own state. other Dogras who have only half a union territory. Far from having a state, we have half a union territory. I'm just putting that on record because uh, one of the reasons why uh, the Dogras have never received their due share is because we never had a state that would actually further the interests of, of, the, of the Dogras. The Dogras was always a sort of a attachment to Kashmir as it were, uh, although it had its own distinct entity and distinct culture and language and, and uh, culture, uh, it was tagged on. And we are still now, as I said, only half a union territory. And the creation of the Jammu and Kashmir state in 1846, with the Treaty of Amritsar, was a very major event in modern Indian history. Because for the first time, it consolidated all these disparate areas, the, the Baltis, the Ladakhis, uh, the Dogras, the Kashmiris, uh, the, the Punjabi, but all into one state. And that state was the state of Jammu and Kashmir, founded in 1846, of which the first Maharaja was Maharaja Gulabs. So the creation of the state of Jammu and Kashmir was a very major achievement in modern Indian history. And it is not adequately recognized that this creation came with tremendous sacrifices from the youth of 
of Himachal Pradesh and Jammu, the Dogra belt. General Zarawar Singh himself was from Himachal. The youth, the Dogra youth, gave ultimate sacrifices in order that this state should be built. And that was a great achievement of Maharaja Gulab Singh. And in modern history, there is no doubt that the Do Dogra history really began with three remarkable young men who left a village in Jammu and went all the way to Lahore to the Sikh Darbar. Gulab Singh, Dhyan Singh and Sujit Singh. These three brothers, Jamal brothers, went, they uh, uh, joined, in fact, they joined uh, Gulab Singh joined as, as, a, as a soldier, but by sheer dint of their capacity, their, their loyalty, their bravery, they, they rose rapidly in the ranks of Shere Punjab Mahaja uh, Ranjit Singh, his army. And Gulab Singh, of course, became a general, one of his most trusted generals, who was always with him whenever he was fighting his wars whether they were in Kabul or elsewhere. And the Sikh Empire, as you know, at that time was a huge empire. Not only Punjab as we do it now, it covered the whole of East Punjab and West Punjab, of course, and Kangara, and it covered a lot of uh, the Northwest frontier and all. So this, the Sikh Empire built up by the great Mahajar Ranjit, uh, Ranjit Singh, the Dogras played a very important role in that. All the three brothers. Dhyan Singh was also a sub at one time chief minister, Sujay Singh. And they gave a lot of sacrifices there. Raja Gulab Singh lost his, his brother, he lost his two sons, he lost. He had three sons, he lost two of his sons with the intrigues in the Sikh court. So remember that despite all of that, he remained loyal entirely to Maharaja Ranjit Singh. But when Maharaja Ranjit Singh passed away, and the Sikh missiles started fighting with each other. And I don't, Gulab Singh realized, I must tell you before that, 200 years ago, exactly almost, in 1822, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, with his own hand, gave a Raj Tilak to Gulab Singh, made him Raja of Jammu. It's very interesting. He gave the Raj Tilak like this, down, top down. And the Pandit says, Nini, nee, you should give him some now. He said, no, I want that his family should be firmly rooted in the ground. And Unki Apni family, his own family has disappeared, but by his blessings and by the grace of, of the divine, our family continues to full force. So that was 1822 when he became Raja. And it was after that that the Dogra forces started expanding. They started expanding uh, in the most extraordinary manner with these trans-Himalayan battles. The conquest of, of Ladakh and of Gilead did not come without fierce battles. It wasn't that we just walked into an empty territory. There were local Rajas there and they strongly resisted. But we had the amount of sacrifice that the Dogras have made in expanding the frontiers of India has never been truly recognized. We must have lost thousands of young men in these battles uh, uh, for Ladakh and for Gilgit. General Zorawar Singh, the iconic General Zorawar Singh, uh, General Baj Singh, Mehta Bastiram, these are the great generals of Maharaja Gulam Singh. And that is how we brought the frontiers of India, extended them all the way up to Central Asia in Gilgit and up to Tibet in the bar. This is a remarkable thing, I must tell you. They were great. I mean, we have, we have had great rulers, great uh, heroes. Maharana Pratap battled well, valiantly. Uh, and Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj also did the most extraordinary things. But always remember, they did fight, they're fighting within India. It is only the Dogras, six first in Kabul, but it was only the Dogras who really extended the territories of India. Otherwise, I make bold to say that if it had not been for the Dogras, our uh, northern frontiers would have finished at the Peer Punjab. 
the fact that we were able to consolidate uh, the the uh, territories the tradition of valor and bravery from Vijay Rajinder Singh onwards down i was responsible for the entire jammu and kashmir state forces being integrated into the indian army as a separate regiment none of the other state forces were able to do that they were all broken up went to the rajput regiment the sikh regiment the jhat regiment the tom it is only jnk regiment thanks to me if i may say so that with my um, strong intervention with pandit jawaharlal nehru he agreed that the jnk state forces general gurdas singh is still there our retired general he must be listening to this now he is 93 now 3 years older than i am only 3 years older than i am not all that old but uh, the, the, it was integrated almost into the Indian. and today it is proud as the jack rifles the jack rifles are the former uh, uh, army of bhaja gurab singh coming down from that time the names are still there of, of the various units then there's a dogra regiment which is also very is from the dogra areas whether from jammu or from himachal pradesh and then there are dogras in many other areas so i think between all of this between the architecture the art the 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 literature the cuisine and the the inclusiveness and the valor of the dogras i think we can be very proud of our uh, of our contribution to indian history we can uh, i mean we may not be as well known which is unfortunate in fact i hope that the textbooks that now our new textbooks that are being made record the fact of what the dogras did for the extension and consolidation of the northern boundaries of india something which has never been fully acknowledged because we've had about a lot of negative uh, uh, historicity by sikh uh, um, historians and the british historians but now we are beginning to revive the dogra history not in order to distort it but in order to present it in its correct light and i have this madhav gulab singh memorial research institute in jammu which is working with your university also in fact the main people there are the pal and and are from from the university uh, we are trying to have seminars to revisit dogra history to try and see what were the what were the great achievements that we did and try and place this whole dogra history in the broader context of indian history technically there have been five maharajas in um, in in the, in the jnk state there was maharaja ranbir singh who was a great he consolidated what maharaja ranbir singh had con maharaja gulab singh conquered he consolidated that punja nagar and these outer areas were also integrated into the kashmir darbar and uh, maharaja ranbir singh was a great visionary The great temple builder, the great temples you see in Jammu, the Raghunath Temple, the Ranveerishwar Temple, dozens of temples were built by him in the Jammu region, uh, and uh, he was a scholar. He had sent his uh, pundits out to collect manuscripts from around the country. We have seven thousand manuscripts in the research library in um, in Jammu. So there was he was the second ruler, Maharaja Ranveer Singh. Then there was Maharaja Pratap Singh, who ruled for forty years, um, whose reign was was marred by by a, quite a lot of intrigues and all. At one stage he was deposed, then he came back into power again. But he was a very saintly person, and it was during his time that a lot of the things done by his, for example, the Ranveer Penal Code, which Maharaja Ranveer Singh had introduced, was then. Uh, cl clarified in the reign of Maharaja Pratap Singh, a lot of new canals were built and a lot of development stake. He was the third. The fourth Maharaja, of course, was my father, Maharaja Hari Singh, who was really the modernizer of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. He came to the Gandhi in 1925, and the first thing that he said is, 
as a maharaja i have no religion my religion is justice i think that's an extraordinary thing to have said at that time and place is it not professor that what a remarkable thing to say and uh, he did he did he got it a begar which is that forced labor the abominable system he threw all temples in jnk open to the harijans as they were then called or the dalits as they are now called in 1929 long before the rest of india he swept the, the temples open i remember pandit devraj was the raj pandit he didn't agree he dismissed pandit devraj and he called his brother pandit balkrishna agar aap mante ho to theek hai otherwise i'll dismiss you also get to his name i i agree so he did that in 1929 and uh, he was the one who built beautiful colleges which are still there in srinagar in jammu the excellent hospitals and uh, um, all the other modernizations that took place it is a great pity that he is only remembered because of the debacle in 1947 but we must remember his achievements before that from 19 125-146, all the work that he did uh, for the consolidation of Jammu and Kashmir, and then, of course, uh, it was technically I am the fifth Maharaja because I was also Maharaja from 1961 to 1968 when the princes were abolished. But I never used the title because I, when I became Maharaja, I made a public declaration I was not going to use the title. as it turned out the titles were abolished a few years later that is a different thing i am always ahead of my time remember that whatever i have tried to do has been to see the future a leap into the future in my own role if i may say so i can't talk about myself but my own role was really to um, spearhead the transition from feudalism to democracy because feudalism had disappeared at that time i realized immediately that the future did not lay in feudalism it lay in strengthening the democratic fabric of india and that's what i in my own way tried to do ever since i was 18 years old when my father made me regent and then how the whole situation changed i became sadr e riyasat and then governor and then cabinet minister and so on So I don't know why people keep calling me former Rajya Sabha member. I mean, I was a member of both houses for God's sake, and I was former cabinet minister, former ambassador. So I hate this former word. You may like that, na? It's looking backwards. You just mention what I am, what I am doing for the future. My father used to speak beautiful Dogri. I speak very nice Dogri. My sons speak very good Dogri, but the grandsons don't. Unfortunately, and this is happening all over India now. One generation is keeping the mother tongue, the second one goes, the third one disappears. It's happening to all of you also, I'm sure. It was the Kashmiris, to the Telugus, to the Bengalis. It's happening to everybody. It's happening to us also. So let me talk about some aspects of Dogri culture. We we'll talk first about literature. Dogri. I remember I was part of the renaissance of the Dogri language, which took place. in the 1940s that began with people like dinu bhai pant and ramna shastri and and uh, um, samel puri uh, those were the, those were the first people who started writing in dogri i remember the first poem was shair palo palge by uh, dinu bhai pant uh, but anyhow um, there were then there were many other people came in the dogri sansa was founded i was there when it was founded i have given them some land in my area where they are still building 60 years uh, onwards but nonetheless they say that they are building so i only believe it when i see the building because you know they haven't invited me to, to the building yet but whenever they do i will be very happy to see it but the dogri movement took root and a lot of very brilliant poets came up we've talked of kamar kamar biyogi We had Padma Sachdev, the poetess who wrote such wonderful poetry. We had Madhukar, K. S. Singh Madhukar, Dola Kona Thappaya, a great poem. You know, there, there are these great uh, young young people. A lot of new young um, people have come up. I am not fully aware of the younger generation, but Dogri language and literature has come up. 
and that's why we insisted that dogri should become uh, uh, a national language there was i must mention one small point in passing there was some talk at one time of trying to revive takri which was a script i opposed it i said if you really want dogri to be understood you have to put it in devnagri of all of ghalib that we learned was in devnagri for god's sake we didn't have to learn you can't learn a, a, a language in order to read it so the takri script was it was all right at its time it showed that we had a certain capacity but i i have supported the dogri literature should be in devnagri so that it's available to a wider audience so that's as far as dogri is concerned my good wishes to all of you who are working in the field of dogri now when you talk of history you can go back into the into the mists of the past uh, they say that uh, there was mention in the in the mahabharata not in the with the word dogra but with the rulers of this area um, there were ancient there were mentions uh, of uh, badur and there are ancient ruins in kirinchi in ambara in various places in jammu we show that the civilization was very old in fact there are some buddhist remains in um, in in ambara which again put the history back many thousands of years when there was the buddhist domination of that area so um, we go back uh, very far in, in in ancient history architecture apart from the ancient architecture the ruins that i mentioned the architecture the way this runas temple for example has been built i don't think anywhere else in the world is there a temple which has one sub temple dedicated to almost every deity in the hindu pantheon if you go around the parikrama you can have darshan of almost all the devas it's extraordinary uh, and then the outer uh, which are the great shiva temples where i have also made additions yeah, uh, to whom i've made a new uh, natraj bagla mukti temple in that outer line so the ramana temple each a successive ruler made his own contribution the architecture the ranveeshwar temple this extraordinary shiva temple which mahadev ranveer singh ji built in jammu it's a wonder of architecture it's built in the form of yantra on a yantra and it is something which i think is quite remarkable so and then the group of palaces known as mandi mubarak is a cluster of many palaces built from time to time perhaps it's the largest cluster of, of palaces anywhere in the world it is not a single palace like the huge palaces in rajasthan it's a whole cluster of palaces and uh, now at last i think something is being done about trying to preserve it because obviously it was uh, many of the buildings were on the verge of collapse so architecture also is excellent then art we were not only fighters we were also people of great uh, artistic uh, sensibilities the pahadi school of art for example the schools in basoli kangra I and mean, the kangra paintings are the most beautiful miniatures in the world wherever i go in the world i have visited all the great museums around the world and wherever i have been there has been a kangra painting there every whether it's the prada in in in, in um, spain or the hermitage in 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 leningrad or whether it is the albert and victor and albert museum in in london or the modern or the museum in new york all of them. so the kangra kalam and the basoli kalam these are two very important schools of pahadi painting in the dogra area and i'd like to tell you that the haritara charitable trust that i have created my daughter josna has started a school of basoli painting in basoli in basoli so one of the masters living masters of basoli painting is teaching youngsters how to develop this this particular school we're trying to keep that alive so in art a great deal has been done 
uh, there are lots of books on Pahadi painting. I don't have to go into that. One fact that the Dogras have been very inclusive. Mind you, the word Dogra doesn't only mean Dogra Rajput. There are Dogra Dalits, there are Dogra Brahmins, there are Dogra Khatris, there are Dogra Muslims. The great Ustad Allah Rakha Khan, the Dogra Master, he was from Jammu. And the son now, Zakir Hussain, who is probably the greatest percussionist we've ever produced, is from Jammu. Shiv Kumar Sharma, the extraordinary Santur player who has introduced a new instrument into Hindustani music, is from Jammu. So Jammu has produced great musicians and cutting across uh, barriers of caste and creed and language. We've always been secular, although I don't like the use of that term, uh, but we've been secular in the sense that we've been inclusive. And in my father's army, they were not only Dogra Rajputs, they were Dogra Brahmins, they were Sikhs, they were Gorkhas and they were Muslims of the Punch Rajauri area. So this is something I think we need to be kept in mind. I had a couple of questions after your. Go ahead. Meeting. Go ahead. The, the the question I had, I think the most one of the most interesting things I think which came out in your lecture was the transition from feudalism to democracy. As you said, was the future of was identified uh, by not just you but even your father Maharaja uh, Hari Singh. And uh, on that note, uh, and you also said that Maharaja Hari Singh introduced many measures which. Uh, laid the foundation if you will for the for democracy to take root uh, by empowering the the kind of the, the the downtrodden and 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 the common man in general in jammu and kashmir what did it take for him to break from those generations of tradition to instill that notion of democracy into an empire that has been ruled by feudalism for generations yes well it must have been difficult for him i must say because uh, Actually, I did the break, but he did, as you said, the foundations for this by the way that he had me educated and by the way that uh, he, he did all these reforms. He was quite clearly not hanging on to an old feudal system, but the actual break must have been painful for him. Much more painful for him than for me. Because for me, it was an exciting adventure getting into the broader national mainstream. For him, it was giving up just several generations of, of poverty. He took it very bravely, I must say. He never complained. And uh, even though he was more or less sent into exile, he never said a word. One sentence by him could have really put India in a very, very difficult position. Because the whole matter was then still before the Security Council. Being that he was, as a great patriot that he was, despite the fact that he felt that he was not properly treated by the government of India. He never once complained. And that has got to go to his eternal credit. Right. Point not really made was something to understand. Absolutely, sir. Uh, so uh, now, nowadays, uh, if we look at the media narratives that are around Jammu and Kashmir and being in the media, um, they're, they're very standard narratives when it comes to JNK. Primarily, uh, is even before and even after the abrogation of Article 370, the common narrative is uh, Hindu-dominated Jammu and Muslim-dominated Kashmir. Mm. And, and primarily the fact, and even beyond that, uh, to an extent, uh, Jammu is not even recognized uh, in, the, in the common uh, mindset of people. Jammu is not even recognized as a dominant or as a significant region uh, of, uh, of Kashmir. Pretty much it's considered that uh, it's a Muslim-dominated state without any other uh, uh, culture or uh, region playing a major role in the makeup of that entire uh, of that entire state. Now, you pointed out something very significant, which I think something many people need to know that the word Dogra doesn't really mean Dogra Rajput. It means Dogra Sikh, Dogra Muslim. Uh, you could be of any caste, creed, and religion. You could you are a Dogra at the end of the day, and you highlighted all those eminent people uh, of different faiths who are from the Dogra community themselves. Why do you think that that nature of identity of the Dogras 
has transformed into this very simplistic narrative that we tend to live with on a daily basis when it comes to uh, the news that we get from Jammu and Kashmir. Well, you know, um, it is true that 80% of the former state of Jammu and Kashmir was Muslim. And it is remarkable that the Dogras, who were a Hindu dynasty, ruled for a hundred years. And there was not any very great tension. I mean, Sheikh Abdullah, I don't want to go into that. He raked up a lot of anti-Dogra feeling. But generally, uh, this was the situation. Now, the, the thing has changed because a considerable part of the Muslim Jammu and Kashmir was even what they did in POJK, the Muzaffarabad Neerpur strip. That has gone there. But still, there is this feeling that, uh, and then what has happened, the tragedy of the eviction of the Kashmiri Pandits Absolutely. from the valley. That is something really very, very painful. I mean, all the shiksha that I have got in my life are from Kashmiri Pandits. I owe them an, an ineradicable debt of uh, gratitude. But the way that they all had to en masse leave, and that sort of, you know, so. You know, from from about 95 percent, it's become 99.9 percent .9 Muslim. That's Kashmir, but mm -hmm. Jammu retained. Jammu never had this sort of pogrom or any sort of uh, uh, sort of evacuation. Apart from what happened in the partition, that is a different matter. But once the partition took place and the state was consolidated, after that there was never any such uh, problem. So um, mm -hmm. I think it's important that Jammu should be recognized. It is people say. You know, it is the state of Jammu and Kashmir which we founded. It is not the state of Kashmir. Of course, Kashmir has its own entity, there is no doubt about it. It has its own culture, it has its own literature, it has its own philosophy. People like Acharya, Abhinav Gupta, who are among the greatest philosophers in the world, it has its Raj Sarangani and so on. Kashmir has its own um, uh, culture and language. Nobody denies that. But Jammu is totally different. It's a different language, it's a different culture, it's a different cuisine, it's a different dress. I mean, we have our own identity. So therefore, to overlook the Jammu identity or to in some strange way mingle it with, as a minority say, that's not the way to look at it. It is Jammu and Kashmir, two distinct entities brought together by my family. Yes, absolutely, sir. So also, I wanted to ask you that you also brought up the contribution of uh, General Zoravar saying you you brought up the contribution of uh, Maharaja Gulab saying not only as statesmen but also as generals who did a great deal in uh, in not only expanding like you said the frontiers of the uh, of of India but also defending uh, the frontiers of India and also inculcating the the notion of Dogra culture into the whole idea of India. Now to a great extent uh, like you were you also pointed out historians be it the British historians be it the the many Sikh historians also as you pointed out they there has been an a, a, a kind of a uh, pushing them to the sidelines of history. Even if we look at modern history, uh, Brigadier Rajender Singh, the first Mahavir Chakra recipient of independent India, he is not known beyond the Jammu region. Mm -hmm. So, what is the nature of politics where such people who are so <laughs> integral in the formation of a, of, of a country, of <laughs> an idea of a country, that they get pushed to the sidelines? What is the nature of politics that tends to do that? And what was the end game of that politics to push them to the sidelines like this? You see, this again brings me to what I said right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. The Dogras are the only ethnic community without a state of their own. Mm -hmm. You know, how is it that the Andhra government pushes Telugu uh, language? That the Tamil Nadu government pushes Tamil at every possible uh, opportunity? That the Bengalis have that? We have no state. Mm -hmm. We have half a union territory. Some of us individually, if you read the book that Harvan Singh has written, Karun Singh 1947 to 1949 to 1964, you can see all that I did in my correspondence with Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, constantly bringing up the points of Jammu. Hmm. Nobody ever brought them up before that. I was the first to do it on, on a public stage. And I was also the first person from Jammu to represent Jammu from the Udhampur constituency in the Lok Sabha. Four times I won from Udhampur constituency in the Lok Sabha. And so uh, the reason is that we never had, we've never had a Doga chief minister except Ghulam Nabi Azad. He was from Jammu. And I must say his two and a half years as chief minister is still remembered both in Jammu and in Kashmir very positive. 
But apart from Ghulam Nabi Azad, all the chief ministers have been Kashmiris. I, I mean, fair, fair enough, the Kashmiris were a majority, so they were, they were the chief ministers. But we never had political leadership of that type. Mm. And if I may say so also, in a in a vein of slight criticism, the Dogras also tend to be very, very, uh, what should I say, disunited. Mm. You know, they, they sort of, uh, they are so individualistic that they, they don't want anybody to emerge. You know that sort of thing. And <laughs> therefore, we never are able to get together, even to the present day. But that's a different matter. That's something which maybe is in our DNA also. The, one of the reasons is the lack of political leadership. Now with the Union Territory, I've talked to the Lieutenant Governor. I think now there's, a, there's a, an awareness that of the importance of Jammu. Kashmir right. is still perhaps the main focus, but now the importance of Jammu is being increasingly recognized. Right. So, my final question to you. Uh, my final question is that uh, you are someone who is, like you have said, and like we all know, you have been at the helm of this cause to propagate uh, Dogra culture, Dogra identity, and also the, the basic rights that the Dogra community has demanded from the center, uh, given the contributions of the Dogras to shaping the idea of India. Now, to a great extent, uh, a lot of uh, people from Jammu have gone to other parts of the world, other parts of the country. Um, well, we're doing well for ourselves. We, we, you know, we're in professional careers, we're in social service, m- many, many different things. Now, I saw, now, what brings us together is the fact that we're all Dogras and we're fighting to kind of like promote our culture. Uh, today's youth are very active on social media, especially in my in my opinion, the, the youth of Jammu and Kashmir, even if they don't have a voice in the mainstream, they are a force on social media. You look at Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, they are a force on social media. They tend to push a lot of the uh, unknown narratives about Dogra culture on social media. So there is that platform that is being recognized by not just politicians, even news media outlets. It's shaping the narrative of how we uh, do political discourse in this day and age. Now, as someone who has led the cause for so many years, what would be your message to uh, just the common Dogras who are set up across this country from Jammu? to even if who are set up even in the west who, or, or who all they want to do is serve the dogra identity in some way or the other what would what would be your message to them as someone who has led the charge for so many years well as you say uh, the dogras are now doing well around the country and abroad there are over there's an international dogra association in london with whom i've interacted there's the other one um, led by manu kaluri i can't remember the name of the organization so there are many people around the world. The big thing I think is for Dogras to keep their identity, not to lose their identity. They, have, they can fit in wherever they have to do because we, we are Indians basically. As Indians then we are Dogras. We, we are not Dogras if we are not Indian because it's part of the Indian uh, the culture of India as I said. But if we, if we keep on to our identity, if possible, if we maintain our language, which is gradually beginning to disappear with each generation, and if we are able to have some organization together, do we some some various other organizations in Jammu or yours, the Common uh, the Yogi uh, Trust? I mean, these are the sort of organizations that will bring together the Dogras from around the, the world. I am a pre-computer generation. I have no idea of Twitter and how you use these these new newfangled social media things. But you are the young people, you should do that. I love appearing on shows like this and then you can put me on Twitter. I don't want Twitter automatically. I'm one, one, one step removed from the social media. But thanks to people like you, and I've done a lot of webinars recently, I must tell you. Since COVID began, I must have done 20, 25 webinars on philosophy, on education, whatever. So this is the way that I can communicate to the rest of the Dogra community. And through you, I send my very warm greetings to the Dogras around India and around the world and wish them well in the years and decades ahead.
thoughts your your kind of your wisdom when it comes to taking this cause ahead uh of course this is something we should all vibe and we should all uh, kind of like carry in our hearts when it comes to championing the cause of who we are and where we come from so uh, i hope uh, that we can carry that energy forward and uh, as as dogras and as uh, indians in general we can understand what the dogra community has brought to the ethos of india